lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I have an ear infection. It sucks. <laughs> it's you like should... my throat's sore because of it. Yeah. On the bright side, it gave my doctor an excuse to give me another, another COVID test. Oh, really? Yeah. How did that go? Well, it's did... not pleasant, well, particularly. I mean... It's not as... So did, my my real question was, did you pass it? <laughs> Is it a pass fail kind of thing? Um, <laughs> well, it came up negative. I, okay. I I still do not have COVID. I was okay. like, you know, this is a waste of time because I'm indestructible. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, yeah, you should have I, just opened with that. I, I am I, impervious to COVID. I don't I don't take these things. I never have it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, complete waste of time. Well, and uh, so um, one of my cousins is he got married last year, but he's uh, his party or reception, I guess, um, is this year because nobody could come to the wedding right. uh, in New Jersey. And um, so <laughs> I'm going to have to get at least one more COVID test before I get on a plane, yeah. um, assuming that I can make it up there. I'd like to make it up there, but there's you know a lot of stuff going on, so I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that it's going to work out. Um, but I, at this point I intend to go up there and I don't intend to drive cause it's like a 17 hour, 18 hour drive. Yeah. Um, although I have considered it, I, I know places I can stop on the way, although the last leg would still be like nine hours, which is yeah. more than I like to drive by myself at this so, point. In my so life. you think any of those places will let you in without a vaccine passport? Of my friends' houses? Oh, so you've got friends' houses? I didn't know. Yeah. What... <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the question still stands. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking I could stop in Atlanta and I could stop in Charlotte. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you, I think both of those places would let you in. Yeah. Um, but I, I think. I'm not, I'm not 100% on the Charlotte, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had to talk to him. Um, yeah. But... Uh, Anyway, that's that's the worst case scenario. Like the the plan yeah. is still to fly. To fly, mm-hmm. yeah. I haven't. I hate flying anyway. So this is all kind of just a good excuse for me not to fly anywhere. Oh, yeah. I don't mind flying. No, I, in fact, I quite I, I like flying because my time is valuable. And yeah. like the difference between, you know, uh, well, all told, it's still kind of crappy because you know you got to get to the airport early and you sit around and so on. So, yeah. um, probably reasonable guess is like 10 hours back and forth. Yeah. Um, flying, flying. Yeah. Uh, including like airport time and what have you, but that's, you know, um, less than a third of the time that it would take me to drive. Yeah. See my, and I've flown, I've flown a few times, but, um, and it's actually more than that because like, even in my youth, I don't think that I would have driven 17 hours straight without a stop. Yeah. And I definitely can't do that now. So yeah. if you're looking at a 17-hour drive, you're talking about a two-day drive. Yeah, you're going to break so, that up into two separate days. Yeah, no. so you're like four days instead of 10 hours or total. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Mm. Well, we um, I flew to Tennessee one time, and so it was a nine-hour drive, and it took me 10 hours to fly there, and I was like, never again. Like I'm not doing this. This is this is not worth it. Like I could have drove it almost as quick as I flew it. Yeah. And the driving would have been more pleasant. <laughs> At least for me. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind flying. You can do you can do kind of productive things in the plane. Although I usually don't. I usually just strike up a conversation with whoever's sitting next to me. Yeah. Um and don't do anything productive. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I like to read. I take a book. I I've got a phone. It's got games on it. Yeah. They, uh-huh. They're games that get kind of boring, like yeah. chess and backgammon. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and I, I'm terrible at chess against an AI. <laughs> Computers are smarter than you. Stupid computer. Well, it can definitely calculate the odds better than me. <laughs> um, wow, that was, that was a long intro. <laughs> uh, so so you, weren't, you weren't real keen on what I wanted to talk about. So what do you want to talk about to start? It doesn't matter to me. I can, we can talk about whatever you want. No, what, go I'm, I'm, you're, yeah. you're carrying the weight today because I have been super busy and a little sick. So I have not really done a whole lot. <laughs> well, I'm not a little sick, but definitely super busy. My mind's been occupied all day. Yeah. No, I kind of thought we might, it might be worthwhile to talk about immigration a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, seeing how it's in the news and everything with the with 14,000 people <laughs> under a bridge in South Texas. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. Like I say, it's just it's something to at least consider. Yeah. Um, do you, okay. So you you have these uh Haitians that I guess boated <laughs> to yeah. to Mexico and then came up or something so like that. So I actually did a little digging into this because this is this has been a big talk online because everybody's saying the same thing you are. Like, mm-hmm. how did these Haitians end up in Mexico? Like, why are they coming at that border and not the closest border, which would be like Florida or something? Right. Um, and what Puerto it is, Rico, I think, would probably be their well, best way into the states. But maybe. Why would you want to escape Haiti into Puerto Rico? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is the whole reason, like, I'm, that I'm just kidding. Puerto Rico. I, I lived in Puerto Rico, but yeah, yeah, but but that actually brings up another point too. Is like they're already in Mexico. So, mm-hmm. like, they've already gotten out of their country that they were fleeing from. Like, shouldn't they just stay in Mexico and be happy there? <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, I immediately thought of the um, the Simpsons episode uh, where Homer becomes the sanitation commissioner or whatever. Yeah. And he's talking about how, you know, you got to carry out your own stuff and all these things. And he's like, that's not America. That's not even Mexico. That's not even Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's probably why. Yeah, well, obviously that's why. But so, they have to carry out their own trash in Mexico and here. <laughs> here, they, they're come, a truck comes and takes it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it turns out the reason these guys are down there, at least best that I can tell, is that they, they fled years ago and ended up in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And they've all of a sudden now decided that they want to come here. But they, these aren't like recent refugees from the earthquake. Um, are they from, I guess they're fleeing from a <laughs> storm that was there? Oh, years okay. ago yeah. it, it could be another earthquake it could be a hurricane yeah. it could be but all kinds of but the, the everything i read seemed to to say that uh, that this group that's trying to get in right now have um been in mexico for almost a decade okay. and and that um for whatever reason they've made their way up this way and that's that that they didn't actually like get on the boat and go to mexico and then mm-hmm. try to come up through the southern border <laughs> like <Okay. it's, laughs> because the the logistics of this are a little odd yeah. <laughs> to say the least all right I wonder so, why this entire community decided to migrate to the U.S. right because now. Because Trump lost and Biden's supposed to be letting everybody in. Oh, is that? Well, I mean, if, but if <laughs> they'd been in, in Mexico for 10 years, like Obama was supposed to be letting everybody in too. I mean, he yeah. wasn't. <laughs> yeah, well, but, and neither is Biden, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, like he's He's got people on the horseback rounding them up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, okay, so do we put... Um, do we put these Haitians in the same category as uh, like um, Afghani refugees that are trying to come to America now also? I mean, is yeah. it d- like, does that all fall under um, the same kind of immigration blanket that you're throwing here or are they separate I, I, issues? I, to, I would put them all in the same, but for my, for my case, I would say, well, I don't want to let any of them in. I don't exactly want to let the Afghans in either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so here's here's the case that I would make uh, on behalf of both of these um, nationalities. Yeah. Like, the U.S. has gone a long way to screwing up both of those countries. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so maybe we owe them. <sighs> The, here's here's what here's where my disconnect is on this. Mm-hmm. So like if if we just let them in, like where are they going to go when they get here? Like I mean, where what do you what do you do with these people who literally have nothing that are coming into this country? I mean, aren't there just, a whole lot of wealthy elites that think that we should have open borders? Well, They're, I mean, they'll take them in, right? Hey, now if that's the case, I'm good with letting in the. Now, if that's if that's like a serious proposal, like I'm down. Like, uh, like you've swayed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but that's never the case. Like, where are these people going to end up? Like, they're just gonna. You're just gonna let fourteen thousand. Like, in Texas, they're gonna end up under interstate overpasses, kind of where they are right now, probably. Exactly. Um, you know, working odd construction jobs like the Mexican immigrant. I don't know. Yeah. Um, which which is where my, that's where my problem is. Like mm-hmm. if, if we were going to bring these people in and we had a plan, I could be swayed. Well, there's the Green New Deal. <laughs> we could just yeah. put them to work converting everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got plenty of people here we could put the work doing that too, though. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, Biden promised a whole lot of high-paying union jobs. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you think these guys have got those type of skills? I don't know. I mean, I don't know either, but... They, they managed kinda... to get from Haiti to Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. There's some level of skill involved in that, I think. Uh, right. Um, okay. It, in all seriousness, um, I... I recognize the practical problems with open borders immigration yeah. um, right now. Uh, my position isn't actually that we should be open borders right now. It's that the open borders is not the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, open borders is complicated by other things. Yeah. Um, for, uh, for a significant portion of this country's history, it was open borders. Uh, now I, yeah. I, I am okay with like you sign in the book as you come in. Yeah. Uh, I, I would kind of like to know who's here. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, I think that you create a lot of problems with a strict immigration policy that, uh, or even, uh, even a fairly loose immigration policy, but a centrally controlled immigration policy is a problem in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, I think that the the problems that you create through the attempts to enforce an immigration policy are um, are uh, more invasive, dangerous, more dangerous than letting the people in. Well, I mean, I think that's a I think that's an open debate because that, um, I I, that's an argument I could be swayed by. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, one way or the other, yeah. um, but I think that that's an open debate. I think that that's by no means a settled question. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, border patrol where we live yeah. can enter your backyard without your permission. Yeah, and I obviously have a problem with that. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, and the whole reason for that is to try and keep other people out. Yeah, but and they can they can infringe on your private property rights in order to enforce this, even though it has nothing to do with. Now, on the other side of that. Yeah. Um, the question of responsibility is definitely an issue here. Yeah. And um, I think that it is hard to uh, advocate uh, an open immigration policy right now um, because the people who end up having to foot the bill are the taxpayers that don't all agree to this. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's and uh, so that's, that's an infringement of property rights as well. Yeah. But that's an infringement of property rights. Like that's actually, you know, them taking money to... Uh, to cover um, whatever kind of public services these people would receive yeah. um, is a drop in the bucket for the amount of money that you have to pay to the government for all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so I think that, but that is a problem in and of taxation is theft. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, well, I, I can get on to the open borders argument mm -hmm. if that's like the last link in the chain as far yeah. as tearing down the government. Mm -hmm. Like once the government is gone, yeah, open up the borders. I think there's, because there's a lot less and it creates a situation where people that come here mm -hmm. will like have a plan. Yeah. Um, Cause it like the Haitians at the border right now, like, those guys, who knows where they're going to end up when they get in here. And that doesn't help anybody. Well, uh, the other part of that is that the immigration policy as it stands makes it difficult for you to invite somebody from outside the country in to do work for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's hard for some things that really shouldn't be difficult. So um, my friend in Charlotte, actually. Yeah. Uh, so he, he's born and bred American, um, but he lived in Honduras for a few years. Yeah. Um, several years. And, uh, while he was down there, he met a Brazilian girl and he married her Yeah, and they had a daughter. Yeah. And then when the, the coup that, <laughs> that the U S played some, a hand in, um, happened in Honduras, he had to leave. Yeah. Um, uh, it became very dangerous for him down there. Uh, and so he had to leave. Yeah. And so he tried to come back with his wife and daughter to the U S Yeah. and they wouldn't let his wife and daughter in. Wow. Actually, I think they would have lit his daughter in, but not his wife. But not, yeah, yeah. Um, so he ended up having to go to her family in Brazil and right. live in abject poverty in the rainforest in Brazil for like six months before he could get his wife and daughter into the country. Wow, yeah. That's now, a that's, problem. That's crazy. <laughs> that's oh yeah. That I 100 percent agree. You know, so. and and I understand the uh, the concern about um, you know marriage for green cards and so forth. But yeah. actually, 
I think if I understand you right, yeah. that wouldn't be an issue if you had your way in immigration policy. If somebody invited yeah. somebody else in, yeah, that's 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 my thing. Is mm-hmm. is you? I that's where I kind of stand on it. Like if yeah. you've got an invitation, if you've got people here, I don't so much have a problem with you coming in. Mm-hmm. It's when we've got you know, 14,000 Haitians that yeah. are like, and, and the same with the, with um, Mexicans too. Like, I mean, if you've mm-hmm. got, if you've got people here already, if you've got like stuff lined up, even if it's a company that's willing to pay you to come into work, mm-hmm. like I'm good with that too. Yeah. Um, I just don't think letting people just flood into the country untethered is a good idea though. Like, yeah, I mean, just like, Letting fourteen thousand immigrants just like walk in is a problem, though. Um, I uh, so I understand like you know if these fourteen thousand people settle in one community, like some small Texas community of forty two thousand people, yeah, or something like that, they're suddenly a quarter of the population, yeah, um, and can have real influence in a democratic system that oh, maybe you don't want them to have. Absolutely, um, in the same way that people in in Texas are already complaining about Californians coming down there, and, <laughs> doing the same thing, yeah. um, screwing up Texas. <laughs> I mean, but again, the concern is really the 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 problem there. Again, is really the power that government wields. It is. Um, it's not these people, yeah. and in in the grand scheme of things, um, if you take the government out of the actually. Immigration could be solved in, uh, was it, I think it was Hornberger that used to say this. Immigration could be solved in a weekend if you just took government out of the equation. Oh, easily. And Um, I agree with that. That's the reason I say that's the last link in the chain. Yeah. I don't think you open up the borders before you tear the government down yeah. because you, you it, it will create so many other problems. Mm-hmm. Well, but it creates uh, some um, some solutions as well. I remember when they became real strict about immigration into this state and we had some crops that didn't yeah. get yeah um, didn't get picked didn't yeah. get picked because the, you know the people that lived here wouldn't work for the wages that. That, that they were being offered, it was only illegals that could that would do that. Yeah. Um, and so, but that's a that's a uh, that's an important point about immigration. Um, immigration does drive wages down. That's true. Yeah. It also drives prices down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, in a in a free market, that's that's not such a bad thing. Yeah. Um, the the big part of immigration policy is a protectionist economic policy. Yeah. Um, and it's protecting special interests at the expense of all the rest of us. Yeah. So, I, I would, I mean, I would agree with that. So. Um, and now, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind having people at, answer a few questions before they come in here. Like, yeah. but the other big concern, like the real, the, the safety concern, um, yeah. again, that's a problem that stems out of either, uh, in the Afghani case, uh, uh, as a good example, um, our interventionism around the world. Yeah. Um, well, and that's... Or in the, um, in the other case, uh, it's a problem of... Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Nah. Well, in the Afghani case, that is my issue with letting Af- a bunch of the Afghanis come over here. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, how the well- drug war is what I was going to say it, oh. with the other one. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of being concerned about criminal issues yeah uh the big the big driver of criminals crossing the border um it's into the drugs. u.s and the southern border is is the drug war yeah you start legalizing it's the, prohibition I, yeah is what i, I was gonna say. say you start legalizing drugs you fix a lot of that problem right mm-hmm. there and to deal with the afghanis that's my biggest concern is i'm all for winding the wars down over there and all of that mm-hmm. i'm not necessarily all for bringing a bunch of them over even the yeah. ones that helped us and i get the reasoning for it mm-hmm. and i'm not absolutely saying nobody that helped us should be let in but I think there should be a very strict vetting process yeah. because, I mean, you just, especially if you just open the floodgates of Afghans coming over here, you can't tell me that some of them aren't going to be, have violent tendencies towards us. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, because, I mean, it's not like we haven't bombed their country for decades. Yeah. And so just because somebody helped us while we were over there doesn't mean they don't have some ax to grind when they get over here. True, but how in the I don't know how you vet in such a way to... To prevent that. And yeah. that's the real problem, which is the reason why I'm not a big fan of bringing them over here. <laughs> well, I get it. But um, again, you know, the the reason that they're having to flee their country is mostly because of the U.S. Yeah. 
Well, which is the reason I want us I to mean, get the hell out of there. Um, <laughs> you know, and again, this is a government problem. It comes back to the government again. But uh, yeah. but is it fair to go um, destroy a country and then say, no, sorry, you've got to deal with it yeah. there? Yeah. Like, we're not helping now. Yeah. <laughs> We've done our damage. We're through. <laughs> right. Um, I, I don't think that that's a, I, I don't, I, that certainly doesn't um, engender any goodwill either. No. Oh, absolutely. So. Um, I mean, I don't know that there's a, I don't know that there's a good libertarian answer to this as it stands. Yeah. Um, I, I think the good libertarian answer to this is uh, it's about private property. You can yeah. invite whoever you want onto your property. Yeah. Um, the problem is that there's a whole lot of public property. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it becomes uh, like the public property um, becomes one of these tragedy of the commons. Like nobody takes responsibility for it in the end. Yeah. It belongs to nobody. And so nobody, or it belongs to everybody. And so nobody, so takes, nobody res- yeah, takes care of it. Yeah. Um, in truth, we know that it doesn't belong to everybody anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with if it was all private property, then people along the border could invite people in yeah. um, if they so chose. Yeah. And if uh, if the next if the adjoining properties didn't want those people in, they yeah. can exclude them. And yeah. so they only get one property into the United States. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, and again, the voting issue is a concern because government wields so much power. Yeah. If, if you stripped back government, especially federal government, to the constitutional level, that's yeah. a whole lot less of a problem. Exactly. So we're not like as far... even if they're voting yeah. and, you know, they're not supposed to be. That's yeah. supposed to be one of the privileges of being a citizen here. And there's supposed to be a process to become a citizen here as well. But yeah, we're not as far apart on this issue as we think. But I, I am not, I, I don't <laughs> currently advocate for open borders though because mm-hmm. because of the reasons we kind of just talked about. Yeah, um, I, I, I do advocate for open borders, but uh, on an ideological level, uh, mostly yeah. because I don't, to me, um, saying that open borders is a terrible idea is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Open borders is not the problem. It's it's Governments. other things that create a problem with open borders. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and I, I want people to focus on those problems that government creates and how the open borders question, like border issues could be solved by removing those problems, not by locking everybody out. Yeah. The problem is, is we're not there yet as far as solving the other issues. And I don't think that you can open the borders up without mm-hmm. solving the other issues first. Yeah, it, it's true. But I want people to think long term, Yeah, um, including in how to solve those issues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that when you advocate a closed borders position, you're essentially giving people an excuse not to worry about the rest of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the truth is, is I'm more worried about the rest of it than I am the border in reality anyway. Mm-hmm. Like when it, when you have my hierarchy of issues, like borders pretty low. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just <laughs> is because it's not an issue that really directly, I mean, I don't live on the border. So yeah, you do. Well, I mean, I do in, in, in the respect that the government can come chomp on my property anytime <laughs> they want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, you know, people come up this way, too. I'm sure that yeah. people enter the U.S. through the uh, port and mobile. I mean. Oh, yeah. No, that's true. Um, but, which that I, may be something a lot of people don't know is like, so how does, exactly does that work? Anywhere 100 miles of the border, including the, the oceans and mm-hmm. the water border. Yeah. Like. You have basically ICE can do whatever the hell they want. Like yeah. they can come on your property, and and that's something without else. your permission. That is something else that I that I have a big issue with is ICE in general. Mm-hmm. So while I do believe in at least it, with the status quo that we have now, like enforcing the border and not leaving it open and not letting people in, mm-hmm. I have a problem with ICE once people are in the country. Just yeah. once they're in here, screw it. They're in here. Yeah. Um, we don't need ICE coming and kicking down doors and coming after people. Checking people's papers. Checking people's papers. Yeah. yeah. Like that, I absolutely have an issue with, mm-hmm. period. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you run into the same problem um, there with the enforcement of so many things. Uh, like the drug war is a really good example of that, too, is that it creates... Um, an environment for proactive policing yep. and proactive policing leads to conflict. Yeah. 
And I, I am against proactive policing in virtually all scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, very few exceptions, I would say. Yeah. Um, and, and just for people out there that may not understand, what I mean by proactive policing is, uh, is police going out and um, interrupting people that don't appear to be doing anything wrong to see if they might be doing something wrong. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying that if a policeman sees somebody trying to break into a house, they shouldn't stop it. Well, yeah. I, I'm saying that um, stopping somebody randomly and then searching them for drugs or checking their papers to make sure that they're legal or, or what have you, in yeah. absence of any other evidence, essentially, um, that creates a conflict. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what I'm opposed to. Oh, absolutely. Now, I think that <laughs> this is a little bit of an aside. I was thinking about this the other day, um, that... Like I would, well, actually I was thinking about it because of the, uh, you know, the police that pulled up on the side and pulled over on the side of the road to catch the speeders out in front of my office. Yeah. And I thought, it seems to me that there's a lot of things that that person would be more valuable in the sense of, uh, securing the community yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's right? got to be something else that guy could be doing that would make <laughs> our community more secure than making sure that nobody's going 40 in a 35. Yeah. Um, and, and so I thought, well, you know, I, I don't want them breaking down doors and checking people everywhere and so forth to, to try and enforce the law. Yeah. Um, but if you had more people that were investigating and trying to close crimes that had been committed, you're like, oh, okay, well, but it's too late by then. The crime's already been committed. Yeah. But if they actually did a good job of closing crimes that were committed, they fewer would, people would commit crimes. I was fixing to say, exactly. There would be less crimes committed because people knew they stood a better chance of being caught. Yeah. <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of wasted energy in that department. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, just like... I still believe that the main purpose of, uh, of at least... Um, local law enforcement is to raise funds for whatever their precinct it's a, is. It's a tax arm. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, you know, they're tax collectors. That's all they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. In the purest sense. You remember what Robin Hood did, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, anything else you got on that? Not really. I just, with everything going on, I felt like that was something that was worth having a, at least a discussion on. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, and I thought that people might enjoy it because it's there's uh, more space between us on that than there is on a lot of things. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Although mostly you just agreed with me in the end, anyway. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think we come at it from different. We're 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 pretty close though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I I agree that in um in ideology at least that we're pretty close. Yeah. Um, I would certainly loosen things up on the border right now. And yeah. I think that you would tighten things up. On I, the I would. Uh, yeah. At least on the border. Now, mm -hmm. like I say, the, the ice and all of that stuff aside, yeah. but like I'm all for, yeah. Securing mm -hmm. the border in the current, current state. Yeah. I, um, and in terms of the refugees, like from Afghanistan, I just to add another point or maybe give, uh, you know, some kind of metaphor. Yeah. Um, it's like if you went and burned down somebody's house, yeah. you might have some responsibility in ensuring that they have shelter. Yeah. So the, the problem I have with this metaphor, though, is I am burning anybody's house down. <laughs> yeah, but but you see my point. Like I, understand, I see, I you see know, your I, point. <laughs> I, I, I'm I try to do a very good job of separating U.S. government from U.S. citizens. Yeah. Um. And it is the it is a government created problem. Absolutely. But uh, again, you know, um, it doesn't matter much to the Afghan people. Yeah. Like yeah. somebody owes them something. Yeah. Uh, and now I, I would be perfectly happy to take it out of the salaries of the federal employees at the Pentagon or something like that to yeah. <laughs> to take care of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but I, I don't think that it I, I don't think that it helps us in the long run to ignore the problem to win. as a country. Well, and the, the, the goal is, is to win the hearts and minds anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that, because that's, that's how more terrorists are created is by going over there and bombing innocent civilians. Yeah. But we're terrible at winning hearts and minds. Yeah. Well, because we're over there bombing innocent civilians. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that, that kind of moves us to our next subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's how we left Afghanistan, of course. Um, right. the, the thing, <laughs> the thing that I'd actually kind of like to focus on, on this. And I, so, um, 
I imagine everybody knows the story at this point, uh, that after the, um, the attacks at the airport, um, you know, Biden announced that we did a drone strike and took care of the planners or what, I can't remember who exactly, but people involved with ISIS K and ISIS and so K. Forth. Yeah. Um, and, uh, then it came out, um, later that what we'd actually done is bombed a family uh, killed at least 10 civilians, including at least seven children. Yeah. Um, and that we didn't hit anybody that was yeah. a terrorist. Well, that's, that's what came out in the end, but it was a slow walk to that. So yeah. initially they were like, Oh, we got them. Like we got, them. that was kind of all it was. And it was like, well, we may have got some innocence when we got them, mm -hmm. but we still got them. Yeah. And then it eventually came out. Well, as it turns out, we didn't get anybody. <laughs> like yeah. everybody we bombed was innocent. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it came out because of independent journalism. Absolutely. Um, journalists went in there and were interviewing people and did their own investigation, yeah. um, including looking at security video and so forth. Uh, up mm -hmm. until that information was released by the journalists, yeah. the U.S. maintained that it had done everything right. Yeah. And in fact, I... I Think it was uh, I think it was Millie actually that came out and said that it was a righteous strike. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so they almost certainly knew better. Yeah. Um, now the the way the story goes, they were following this guy around for a long time, and we've talked about signature strikes repeatedly on this podcast. Yep. And I, I've actually had some people tell me that I was just paranoid and silly to think that, um, you know, the story that I tell about how signature strike might work, yeah. uh, in that, you know, I'm going to the office and it seems I, I can't find my phone and I'm like, Oh shoot, I, I've forgot my phone. And I do like a, you know, a couple of left turns to start heading back towards the house so that I can pick up my phone. Um, and then I hear it buzzing. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know where it is. I'm like, okay, so fine. So I pull over on the side of the road and I'm, I'm I stop for a minute while I'm searching around for my phone. And well, I find it under the seat. Okay, well, there's my phone. I put it back in my pocket. Um, I do another U-turn and start heading back towards the office. Now that could get me targeted because it looks like I'm doing counter surveillance. Yeah. Uh, trying to lose a tail or identify if somebody's following me. Yeah. Um, and so that would be potentially reason enough to drop a bomb on me. Yeah. All right. Um, and that's essentially what happened here. Yeah. They followed this guy around for a while. He was working for some aid organization, as I understand it. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, was moving things around from place to place and he was, uh, he loaded up his car with what they thought might be some kind of explosive, uh, it turned out to be water bottles because they didn't have any water at the house. <laughs> um, and he lived close enough to the airport that he could have been used as a staging area for a strike. And that's what it took. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's the world that some people are living in. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's like, if you live in Afghanistan or some of these other places where we use these tactics, like that's really all it takes for you to get bombed. Yeah, uh, the I encourage people to look into the, um, to the effects and the um and the methods of the drone war. Yeah, uh, it's it's unreal. Like, and it, it, you know, and they're trying to bring it back here. Yeah, well, by that's, the way, that's the really scary part. Yeah. Is like it's bad enough that anybody's having to live under these conditions and mm -hmm. have these type of things happen to them. Yeah, but. These same tactics are trying to be used in this country. Yeah. Like we're moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, it has, uh, but I, I just like a, a short little bit about it is that places where we're um, engaged in a drone war, the U.S. government is engaged in a drone war, the U.S. military um, uh, has significantly higher rates of PTSD because you can hear them. Yeah. Like yeah. you can hear them flying above you. Yeah. Um, and you know, you think the lockdowns are bad here because the government's telling you you should stay inside because, uh, you know, you might get sick. Yeah. Um, in those places, they hear these things and they have to stay inside because they might get a bomb dropped on. Them. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know who it's after. Yeah. You yeah. don't want to be standing in the wrong place and they hit the wrong place with some frequency. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a whole lot more than the government lets on. Yeah. This case is a good example. Yeah. I can't imagine that the U.S. government really was so certain that they, they hit nothing but terrorists. Yeah. Um, they had to know better. And they started walking it back once some information started coming yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and that, to me, indicates that they knew better and they just hoped that the whole story would never come out. But it did. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it was hard to get them to admit anything. Yeah. And in the end, they're like, well, we'll pay the families or whatever. Oh, yeah, that makes up for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, it, but it, in another sense, it's like the perfectly poetic way for us to leave Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, to, uh, I mean, there's been a boondoggle since we got there. Yeah. yeah. Um, be attacked by the, not the people we were fighting on the way out. Yeah. Um, and then drop a bomb on not the people we were fighting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't or it was responsible for the people that attacked for, us on the way out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. We just hit a bunch of civilians and a bunch of kids. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's like a perfect representation of, what a of everything this war stood for. Yeah, what a mix up the entire thing was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that guy Millie, uh, who told us it was a righteous strike. Yeah, I think it was him. I could be wrong about that. I probably yeah. shouldn't hold him to that quote because I don't remember <laughs> for certain that that was him. Yeah, could have been Kirby or something. Who knows? Anyway, um, there some information has been released related to Bob Woodward's new book, um, that. This guy uh, told, um, contacted a Chinese general in the waning days of the Trump presidency, and uh, and and told the general um, that if uh, if there were, if the president intended to attack China, uh, it wouldn't be a surprise because he would let him know. <laughs> Which, by definition, is treason. Well, if we were at war, I yeah. think. I mean, you know, they, they kind of toe the line about whether China's an enemy or whatever. They start using words like adversary in the same way yeah. um, that we use police action instead of war in Vietnam, I think. Yeah. Um, but, like, there's so many things wrong with this. I don't, I don't even know where really to begin. Um, first off, I'm kind of curious what it was that made him think that. I think yeah. that he would have to know better. Because, well... Uh, Trump was certainly waging what I would consider an economic war with China, yeah. um, a, a economic protectionist uh, war um, with China. He didn't show any indication that he wanted to be involved militarily much of anywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And certainly not with China. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure where the idea that Trump, I mean, it, it's fallen into the you know Trump derangement in the sense that well, in both senses, actually, um, that Trump was so deranged that he could do anything. Yeah. Um, and that this guy had the Trump derangement syndrome to the point that he thought that that was true. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, he had already orchestrated the January 6th incident. Like, yeah. You know. I mean, okay. And so that's an interesting point too, because, um, on January 8th, so the insurrection on January 6th that, that yeah. Trump quote unquote orchestrated, um, which, Whatever we don't we've talked about that enough probably anyway. But um, on January eighth, this guy Millie um, now he's chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Okay, all right. Um, he called together uh, top military commanders to the Pentagon on January eighth um, and gave them instructions not to execute any orders that came from the commander in chief um, <laughs> unless they had gone through him first. Millie. Yeah, yeah. Um, now. Millie, as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, is the top military advisor to the president. Advisor. Yes. He has absolutely no command authority. Yeah. None. Yeah. <laughs> None. But, but he basically just took the military over. Yeah. At least during that period of time. Yeah. And, I mean, I think that that could be defined in many ways as a military coup. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like that's an insurrection. It seems yeah. to me. Um, <laughs> I would agree to uh, to tell the military not to listen to the elected president that he was in charge now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, for th I I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there. Uh, okay, so <laughs> there's some funny things about this too. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that say, well, you know, it's actually I know because that's how it's been played in the media. Like, thank goodness we had Millie there to make sure that the president wouldn't launch a war on China in the waning days of his presidency. Yeah. Now, in some ways, I agree with that, except for the part where there was any possibility that Trump was going to launch a war against yeah. China. Um, but let's be clear about what Milley did here. So if Trump had decided to launch a war, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have actually stopped anybody. He would have just let them know so they could hit us first. Yeah. Or, you know, defend uh, and wipe out our operation, whatever it yeah. happened to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th this is another, <laughs> this goes back to the doomsday machine thing too. Um, so what if Millie was so paranoid about this yeah. that he made this call 
on in, an assumption that Trump was doing something. Yeah, incorrectly. And uh, the response from China was to launch their 300 to 400 nuclear missiles at us. Yeah, yeah. Just because this guy was paranoid over something that wasn't yeah. going to happen. Um, I, I, yeah, it is hard to to really define how dangerous this could be. Yeah. Um, but that being said, um, if somehow uh, Trump had decided to do this for some reason, Trump had decided to do this and wanted to launch a nuclear attack on really anybody. Yeah. Um, I in I. I would hope that there would be somebody like Millie that would put a stop to it. Yeah. That would stand in the way. Yeah. Um, and these kind of things have happened but in the past. But that's going to be the guy that's got his finger on the button. That's not necessarily going to be. don't you know? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's not going to be <laughs> Millie. That's, there's going to be some commander that has to execute the order mm -hmm. to launch the missiles. Yeah. And this has happened in the past where, um, you know, what seemed to be legitimate command authority came down to launch missiles mm -hmm. and people stalled. Yeah. Yeah. Because I certainly hope, now this was a long time ago when the threat of nuclear war was at the front of everybody's mind, yeah. um, where people had seen a nuclear blast in the aftermath, uh, yeah. you know, in their lifetimes, yeah. um, or a lot more of them had, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of, I certainly hope that still today, people that have that responsibility recognize what a huge thing that is. Yeah. Like recognize the weight of that. Yeah. Um, now if I had my way, we would just get rid of all these weapons. Yeah. That's the I, I, as long as they exist, they're a danger. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't matter, um, how well it's safeguarded. Yeah. It, the, you know, all, all these safeguards only work until they don't, and they only have to fail one time. Yeah. Well, one time it's it's a difficult thing though because how do you put the genie back in the bottle? There's no way yeah. all of these countries are going to give these things up. Like we just don't live in that environment. Well, uh, I think um, it may have been Scott Horton, but uh, you know somebody else that I listened to, I, I'm pretty sure it was Scott Horton, um, said, "Well, the U.S. would just have to take the first step, yeah, and get rid of all our nuclear weapons because yeah. the truth is we don't need them. Yeah, we've got more than enough con conventional munitions to." Wipe out, wipe out anything we need any nation in the world yeah yeah right so we don't need them to threaten to destroy another nation yeah um and it would be a, you know a good first step for the u.s to say look we really think that this is such a danger to humanity yeah that we are getting rid of all of ours and we well, hope and, and I, pray that you all do the same yeah and remind everybody as we do it that we can still wipe you out well i don't think we need to yeah yeah. I, I don't. I think that I, I, I think, think that everybody that that is in the nuclear game knows, knows that. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, That's an interesting thought. I never considered that, but I mean that that actually makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, I've been reading Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine, and essentially the the grand point of all this is that as long as these things exist, yeah, it, it is a ticking time bomb. Oh yeah, and it will go off. Yeah, it's only a question of when. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that we've made it this far is kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a miracle. There's been <laughs> some, yeah. maybe some divine intervention to have gotten this far. Yeah. Um, but it only has to fail one time. Yeah, no, it's true. And, you know, you're talking about really the end of civilization. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, at least as we know it. Yeah. You know, then that's when the roaches take over. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people would survive and people would have to rebuild and it would be very different, but you're... Like you're practically starting from scratch. Yeah, yeah. So, so civilization as we know it would cease to exist. Yeah. Um. So anyway, um. You know, I like I said, I I would hope that in were this legitimately to come up, there would be somebody like Millie to step in and and stop it. Yeah. Um. But the other danger of this is that a military leader. Um, stepped in and subverted the civilian control of the military, um, control of the duly by the duly elected president of the United States, and that is the the president's primary job. And it was done very purposefully um, yeah. to have the military in civilian hands. Yeah. Um, and by an elected official. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about the deep state all the time. Um, this is the deep state. These guys at the Pentagon, these unelected bureaucrats and and um, and military leaders, to think that they 
would be making the decisions about what the U.S. military is getting involved in. And frankly, I think that they do most of the time anyway, so it's already scary. But yeah. um, but these are people who benefit potentially yeah. from uh, from additional wars and conflicts. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, and I think that they have something to prove, and that's that's frightening as well. Now, to me, the real answer to this problem, um, because we we want civilian control of the military. We don't want the military to control the military. That's just dangerous. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, they they only have one tool and one fix. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Every, uh, yeah. When, uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like yeah, a nail, that's right? that's what that's I was looking for, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the, the answer to this is to go back to the constitutional way it's supposed to do, be done. Yeah. Um, that you take the... Uh, the uh, um, what, what's the, the term to act totally on your own? Um, unilateral? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, to take the unilateral control of the military, of strikes by the military away from the president. The president was never supposed to have that that power. Yeah. Um, and he, the president, they got to go to Congress. Yeah. Congress has to sign off on it. Exactly. And it's not like you couldn't get a quorum together in essentially no time for a vote on. Yeah. It would be way this. easier now than it was back then. Yeah. When this was all came up with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, war proceeds a lot faster than it did back then too. It's fair, um, but still though. Like, yeah. Um, technology's kept up. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's mostly been driven by the military, I would <laughs> wow. say. But, um, but yeah, uh, the the answer to the concern about um, the president launching a unilateral war against another nation is to put the power of war back in the Congress where it was supposed to be. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And I think you'd see a lot less because the uh-huh. the reason we're so freely able to go to war is because the Congress, nobody in Congress really has to pay the piper. Right. Because the American people overall, at least, are anti-war. Uh-huh. Um, and so the, any congressman that voted for a war that was BS would pay in, at the ballot box. Yeah, I mean— at least uh, with the terror wars over the last few years, all the polls I've seen show a super majority of Americans being opposed to them. Yeah. Um, now, the truth is, is going into Afghanistan, like that had public support at the time. It did. Like it absolutely did. Well, that's because they lied to us. Does it really they, count? Um, is it is it really public support if you had to lie to get the... Well, there's Isn't there's a lot support? of a lot of truth in that too, and I I get where you're going, mm-hmm. but at the same time, at least there was public support. You can at least make that argument though yeah. that we would have went into that war had Congress had to have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think we'd that have left it a lot sooner. I I don't think that we could have got Iraq in that way though. Yeah, you're probably right. I think that Iraq um, would have um because I know Iraq's where I saw the light. Like yeah. I mean, I was all for Afghanistan, but once we started talking about Iraq, that's when I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, let's pump the brakes here." Yeah. Well, um so moving beyond that to things that a lot of people don't uh, you know, don't know about, what about Somalia? Yeah. We we in, went back into Somalia very quickly after we went into Afghanistan. Yeah. Um so Somalia, um Yemen, Syria, yeah. Libya, Mali, we're all over the place. How many Americans would have been on board with all of that? Yeah, not very many. And one more thing, talking about Afghanistan, we wouldn't have been hit on 9-11 if... Um, if we hadn't been bombing Iraq for all that time? Exactly. For a decade? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you turn it over to the Congress, that stuff doesn't happen. Yeah. Because those, those, like I say, those congressmen would pay the price. Mm-hmm. So... I, I don't think those none of that could have been sold to the American people. The only reason they could it have probably sold. would have helped too if Madeleine Albright hadn't gone on national television and said that uh, the deaths of half a million children, Iraqi children, was worth it. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was a price worth paying. Yeah, I you know so I I have a uh, a radical liberal um, aunt. I love her. Yeah. Uh, and you know she's very involved and engaged with politics and i i was i don't even remember what the argument was about it to, that started that but it ended up leading to that yeah um and uh you know that statement about madeline albright being on 60 minutes and being asked point blank if she thought that the the starvation deaths of half a million Iraqi children which was the estimate by the un at the time okay. um from our blockade and bombing um was worth the price to try and get Saddam Hussein out of power. 
<laughs> and she said, yeah, we think it's worth it. We think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and I said that, you know, that's just, <laughs> that's like one of the most terrible things I've ever heard. Yeah. And she said, well, so my, my aunt yeah. says, well, I, I mean, I don't have the context there. Like yeah. you're just telling me this one bit. I said, well, in what context yeah. do you think it is justifiable for the deaths of half a million children yeah. <laughs> to push one autocrat out of power? power? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you can come up with a scenario where that seems justifiable to you, I'd like to hear it. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, yeah, the, the answer is to push it back into Congress. And the reason that the p- war powers were put in Congress in the first place by the founding fathers is because they saw the executive as the most the 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 executive branch is the branch most likely to abuse the power of the military. Absolutely. The the one most interested and and least deterred from going to war. Yeah. Well, um, they got the most to gain from it. Yeah. You know. And uh, so this was you know very pointedly done, and but we've just removed that entirely. And yeah. part of the answer is like I said earlier. Well, now it's a police action or, a, um, yeah. you know a. a whatever, a, a single strike or a, yeah. um, a retaliatory strike or whatever they call it. Like, the, we don't call anything a war anymore. We haven't declared war since World War II. Yeah, yeah. And we've exactly. been at war pretty much constantly since then. Since then, then exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Biden said the other day that uh, for the first time in 20 years, the U.S. is is not at war. Yeah, that's but that's just not the case. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, if... First off, we are still actively involved, military actively involved in several places. Yeah. Um, and the other part of that is like if we if we use the definition uh, that he would have to be using yeah. in order to um, to make that statement, which is that we haven't declared war on it, on any nation or we're not actively at war with any nation with which we've de- declared war. Yeah. Um, then. It's been more than 20 years. It's been 70. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. 75. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. And, uh, but that's, you know. We, but, and everybody knows that's not the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. That's all I got. You got anything else? No, that's, that's really all I got, man. Yeah. That wasn't, I don't think that was too bad for a, uh, a podcast that I had absolutely zero time to prepare for. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> so. Yeah. Well, so. um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, of course, keep at this, uh, schedules are weird right now. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I work in the, uh, insurance industry. And so, um, Ida has, uh, increased your workload. Yes, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> um, and it's only going to get worse over the next couple of weeks. I, I suspect, yeah. uh, is how it usually goes. Yeah. Um, so we're, you know, we'll do our best. Um, and it, may not have as re- as much research behind it as it usually does. I, yeah. I still read and so forth, but I don't have time to, to dive deep. Yeah. Um, and so. Well, maybe we can take on more philosophical questions. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I mean, can, that's, that's you know. kind of how we geared this podcast initially. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> I can blow smoke for 45 minutes. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> ask, ask the big questions. Yeah. Which is kind of the reason I wanted to dive into immigration today. I mean, it was in the news, and it is kind of a bigger question. The question's yeah. bigger than what is in the news, you yeah. know. So kind of, kind of get down yeah. into that. You know? I, I'm, a, I'm kind of a big picture guy anyway. I like the, yeah. the Absolutely. far outlook. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the plan, of course, though, is to be back in a week. Uh, in the meantime, you know, try and, um, well, follow us on, I always forget all this stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube. Um, uh, you can always visit our website. You can download the podcast from there as well. Um, and uh, Liberty Larry will probably give me some more pushes about writing more. Yeah. Um, hey. Or writing again is yeah. <laughs> probably a more appropriate way of. I, was, I just want us to take a little victory lap at the end of this podcast. We didn't discuss COVID at all. Well, now you've ruined it. I ruined it, but it was worth it mentioning. It just occurred to me. I was like, this is kind of nice. This is a good change of pace. Yeah. I yeah. like it, man. <laughs> Can't help it, man. It's just in the news. Well, it is, but it was good to have a podcast where, mm-hmm. I mean, I just brought it up, so I guess it came up at some point. But still, though. Like, no, bringing it up to point out how we didn't bring it up. Is- yeah. Yeah. Not quite the same as... Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I'm just saying, take a little victory lap yeah. there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'll have a drink after this. Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, yeah, so like and subscribe, um, share, uh, comment. You can always email me at michael at the liberty mike dot com. Um, is that everything? I think that's it, man. Okay. Well, good uh, enough. Yeah. Good enough uh, for government work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Doesn't take much. Yep. Um, all right. So we will be back in a week uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.